Thank you so much for watching my videos. Hey, please like, thumbs up this video, and also subscribe. And when you subscribe, make sure you hit that notification bell so that you can be alerted to my new videos. All right, we're getting ready to get into this. Peace. How y'all doing? How y'all doing? Y'all tell me I've got my little work mic on. And y'all let me know if it's too loud. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This is Pamela. And we are here to review Loki Season 2, Episode 2, y'all. I will tell you this episode, compared to the first one, had calmed down a little bit. The chaos level had come down, but there's still a lot of chaos. As we left our... Loki and them, you saw Docs and uh, X-57, I think is what it is, Brad. That's what we're going to call him because the episode is called Breaking Bad. And he is Brad and uh, on the sacred timeline, his name is Brad. So I'm going to share my screen. But anyway, before I share my screen, we last left them, uh, the sacred timeline, the, the, the loom. Uh, couldn't handle the different branches of the timeline. So it is just, you know, you have so many branches going into the loom to then just to, 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 tw to twirl it like yarn to make it one big, thick strand of a timeline called the sacred timeline. So it's having pro problems holding that much capacity. So then you have the TVA, they're scrambling because now most of the people there realize that the work that they were doing, the mind numbing 17 break, 17 minute break having work that they were doing, just clogging, they were causing real harms and problems. And that always reminds me of like a governmental bureaucracy. There's so much stuff that you've got to do. There's so many people, you know, for every action, there is a piece of paperwork that goes with this action and it keeps going, it keeps going. And after a while, somewhere around in the cog of machine, uh, it just takes one piece of paper to not be seen by one supervisor who happened to go on vacation that sits in his inbox. And uh, something by the time he gets back from vacation, it's something that should have been done and completed for that morning of uh, when he got back from vacation, but he doesn't see it to this afternoon, which caused to that afternoon, which causes a breakdown somewhere. And before you know it, all havoc and chaos has ensued. Now, that's not exactly what we see at the TVA, but you do see a, a, a breakdown, particularly, I'd say with the morale. You look at them and they are defeated because now they clearly understand what their company, what their organization is doing. See, before they were just doing the work, things didn't seem as real until it was made to be real. You know, they just thought they was out here just basically doing, you know, pruning them from the timeline as if it wasn't. It's almost like they didn't think that these people were dead. It was, they just thought that they were just pruning them up like you know how you take a, you take a tree you prune the little branches off and stuff like that and you don't think anything of it because when you see it it's still living until you put it on the side of the curb and a few days later you see it start getting the leaves are starting to droop and it's starting to go uh brown because it's actually dead but all you see is oh i just did this on this tree i know that was so long but that's what made me think about what was going on in, with the tva so let's get into it i'm gonna share my screen uh, let's go here. All right. Can you see me? Do I need to pull over? What up, y'all? There we go. Oh, no. There we go. Yes. See me. All right. So at the beginning of the episode, you see Loki and uh, Morbius. They have mater materialized. On the sacred timeline, I'm just trying to get to my little part where I can, you know, it's right over here somewhere. I can find you. What is going on? 
Hold on, y'all. These are my pictures. Here we go. So they have uh, materialized on the sacred timeline in London in 1977. Now they're looking for Sylvie. And apparently the tin pad that uh, Brad or Doc had, key, the last key point before it went dead came to here. So this is what they're doing. They are running around here looking for Brad. But they, uh, they know Sylvie is not there, but they're looking for Brad. And so they're just sitting there and they're making all this discussion and everything. So then we see Brad. If you look up at the marquee, you see the movies entitled Zaniac. So Brad then went and got on the sacred timeline. I guess he figured he was going to live his best life, y'all. He was going to live his best life. He was going to live his best, best life on the sacred timeline. So he was just going to be a big old movie star child. And so his movie's coming out and it's premiering. And old Brad is playing the part, honey. That's old Brad right there, old Zaniac. And he is playing the part. He is eating up all of this. Look at him. Getting out of the, uh, the cab, just having a good old time. And at first when I saw this, because I think this is one of the previews, I thought maybe this was something that happened in the past, but it's our present, but he's back in the, the timeline in 1977. So he's living his best life. You see him? He is living his best life. And they're like, oh, he's an actor. And then, you know, Morbius is kind of a. Uh, Morbius knows what's going on, but he gives me like a sense that he's in a, a little bit of denial. Like, no, nah, you know, maybe he's undercover. And we're like, yeah. And so he's eating up. Uh, uh, Brad is eating up, the t eating up all the the. the how everybody is, and then he runs into Morbius, and he's like, oh, Morbius, how y'all doing? And, you know, hey, we need to talk. Baby, that's the oldest trick in the book, because homeboy is about to get out here and go. He runs out the back, and then B215 B or B15, she catches him back there. They're fighting. Uh, she doesn't get him, but she does get his, uh, his tin pad. And she realizes it's been modified. So Brad gets to running and Loki and Morbius get to trying to find him. And I mean, he's running everywhere. And he ends up running. Um, he ends up running into Morbius. Morbius catches him. But again, uh, Morbius is not a natural. And Morbius is, is a little bit older. He, I don't think he's ever was a hunter. I think he's been more of a paper pusher type of guy. So he does, you know, Brad gets the best of him. And then here comes Loki. And Loki's as smooth as ever. Look at him. Look at him. Just smooth. Just smooth. Loki comes in, and I guess it's his time. Let's see if I can make this bigger for y'all. Yeah, let's do it like this. Hold up. I swear, y'all. Me changing one little thing. There it is. <clears throat> All right. Movius comes, I mean, excuse me, Loki comes in. They give chase. Brad eventually gets away from Loki. He has some kind of a gadget that causes for him to, uh, this little gadget on his hand, that if you press it, he just materializes someplace else. You see how he goes and he's gone. So Loki decides, okay, I can't, I'm not going to run after Brad. I'm just going to use my enchantment powers. Because you remember, Loki has the power of, uh, making himself uh, multiple different, you know, he can, what do you call it, multiplicity. He can make multiple copies of himself. And he can be different people at the same time. So uh, Brad thinks he's good until he runs into this whole uh, gang of people. And I am thinking all of these gangs of people are Loki. They're different, uh, uh, different uh 
I can't even speak. Different versions of Loki. You know how Loki can copy you. So I think these are different versions that Loki has um, copied over his time. So he's copied all of these people and he gets it. He he copies all these people. They interact with Brad. Brad gets to fighting. And then next thing you know, uh, there's this little green um, aura because this is the big guy. And he goes to fight with Brad. Brad picks up something getting ready to hit him. And when Brad hits him. Here we go. When Brad hits him, so it doesn't it doesn't go well. And then here comes Loki. And they ended up taking uh capturing Brad and then taking Brad back to the TVA. And this is what I thought was really I like this how we see the two Lokis, the The shadow Lokis, as I'm going to call them. Uh, Loki's ability to, to, to harness that power, and he grabs old Brad. And Mobius comes back like, do you think that this is a bit much? You see all the three Lokis, and then their shadows end up grabbing uh, Brad. And uh, Mobius says, you think this is a bit much? And Loki doesn't think so. So they ended up taking him back to the TVA, and they're going to interrogate him. Uh, they have his tin pad, and they see that it's been modified, and they don't understand the modifications of the tin pad. And they go to interrogate him as to, you know, what did you do to your tin pad? How does your tin pad work? And he said, uh, let me see. He said something. He he said it does something. I can't remember what he said it does, but they're going to have OB take a look at it. So they run down stairs to our old friend OB. And OB is down there t uh, tinkering with something. This right here. I think in my last video I had talked about it. How uh, even though this is uh, back in the day. But if you ever watch those 1950s, 1960s. Uh, movie well they're not movies but maybe like commercials about all the innovative stuff that's going to come into the future and this is their vision of what innovative stuff that was going to be in the future and then now it's just i just love the look i love to look at all the stuff that they that they believed was going to be innovative and just look at all the little different stuff this is old school stuff but back in the 50s and the 60s it was innovative you know, it was the the new hotness, that new stuff, you know, and they had a lot of stuff. I think I'll put up some pictures or something like that to show. Uh, I remember there was a refrigerator that did all of this stuff. And I mean, it was it was absolutely wonderful. They don't even make it. You know, uh, I don't know what happened to uh, American ingenuity and, and creating different things. Now, everybody just uh, it's like carbon copy of stuff you ship. Uh, you've got this just one particular idea that comes out and everybody makes like a different version of everything, just like refrigerators now. They're side by side. The freezer's on the bottom. There's really, when you look at refrigerators now, the innovation that that 1950 something refrigerator that I saw would be perfect right now if they would take the time to go back and look at those designs and recreate them right now. But I'm going off on a tangent. I'm going off on a tangent. Sorry, y'all. But anyway, I love this. I love the color palette. Just something about it is just me. It makes me happy. I don't know. Every time I see it, it just makes me smile. So OB is down there at the bottom. You know, they hear OB. They just don't see OB. And then as they peer over the um, as they peer over the desk, they see OB. You see him. He is down there tinkering because. OB is still trying to figure out how to save the sacred timeline, how to save the loom, because if the loom does not get get put back together, that timeline is just going to just explode. So this is what he's doing. And as he's doing it, he look, they give him the tip pad and they ask him, was that he asked him, is this the most important thing? And he was like, no. 
He says, so y'all need to give this to somebody and figure it out. Meanwhile, uh, what is his name? I don't know why I want to call him Conrad. I don't remember what his name is. But anyway, the man with the stain in his pocket is what we're going to call him. Uh, he's talking to B-15 and he's talking about that, uh, the Renslayer chase, you know, he's acting like this is some kind of corporate espionage. He is just whispering stuff. And she's like, baby, why are you whispering? This woman done tried to take over the TVA. She done killed some people. Why are you whispering? Tell me what you found. And he says he erased the data from her temp pad, but he found some little extra stuff. And what he found was that Miss Minutes was in cahoots. Cause you remember at the end of first season, Miss Minutes gave Renslayer all this information, and she said he would want you to have this information. So she took that information and she went wherever she went. So meanwhile, you see, you see Loki and Mobius trying to go through the little TVA book, the Policy and Procedure Manual. Now, see if these folks had read this Policy and Procedure Manual back back when this whole thing started, they probably wouldn't have half these problems that they have. Because I'm willing to bet you in this policy and procedure manual, it tells you how to get to another uh, version of Kang. Now, you let me tell it again. You remember how I talked about before in the earlier parts, how every a bureaucracy is so bogged down in, in papers and paperwork and stuff like that. But the one thing that they need to keep everything going is that policy and procedure manual. And baby. Or Boris wrote that, and I don't think anybody has read it except for a uh, man with the with, with the spot in his shirt. And they're trying to read it. And B fifty two comes up and she tells you uh, tells them that uh, Miss Menace is working with Renslayer, and this is the reason why all the little uh, mechanical stuff and everything is not really really working because Miss Menace handled all of the diagnostics and stuff like that for the TVA. So with her being an AI and she's not there, uh, the people doing it manually is not going to work. It's, it's not working. That This corporation wasn't set up or designed for the people to work without some sort of uh, artificial intelligence. So they come in and... Oh, dude, with this ink spot, he realizes that, that whatever Brad told them that the template did, he told him it doesn't do. He said, did you read the TVA book? He read the TVA book, so they pass it off to him to figure out what's going on. So then they go in here to, inter to interrogate Brad, and it is, it is difficult. It's a little difficult than what they thought it was going to be, simply because uh, Brad knows all the techniques. He knows all the techniques. So, so they had to go back and try it again. And then the next time they tried it, they just let Loki decided, you know what? Since I am as bad as y'all think I am, I'm going to try my own little technique. So he pulls in this machine and, and Brad is a little wary about this machine because, you know, he thinks that uh, Loki doesn't know how to operate it. And apparently it cannot be operated without his little mouse pad, his keypad, excuse me. And. Loki fakes Mobius out like he doesn't have the uh, keypad. So Mobius goes out, goes out, getting ready to go get the keypad. Loki locks him out. He pulls the keypad out of his jacket, and then he starts taunting and 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 and, and uh, asking Brad all these questions. And Brad is not willing to ask him. So you see this little cube thing, baby. Apparently, this thing can either size up or size down. And Brad knows exactly what this thing is. And they must have been um, erasing people off the timeline or killing them with this. Because this seems torturous. And look at Brad. Brad is a little wary. And baby, he puts him in this, 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 this cube. And every time, let's let's go back. Look at this. You see how small he got? And he's scared. Brad is scared. And he, you know, Brad is still talking, trying to convince Loki. And he realizes that Loki is not the one to be uh, reckoned with. And all of his TVA training has not trained him for Loki and his conniving ways. Because, you know, Loki don't mind unaliving nobody. He does not mind it. 
And do you see Brad shrinking? You see it shrinking? He continues to lie. He continues to lie. He continues to lie. And every time he lies, it gets smaller and smaller. It gets smaller and smaller until he cracks. And uh, Loki lets him go, and he tells him where Sylvie is on the timeline. He opens the door, and uh, they're getting ready to go get Sylvie. We see these two. They're going down. Casey is his name. I don't know why I want to call him Connor, but his name is Casey. Shout out to <laughs> to Close Caption, honey, because because your girl is bad with names. I remember a face forever, but I'm bad with names. But Casey and B-15 get downstairs to uh, Ouroboros. Baby, Ouroboros is in there screaming and hollering that we all going to die because of the fact that he can't open the blast doors so that he could go out there and fix the uh, the loom. And apparently, uh, you, <laughs> you need faith <coughs> and aura recognition. And the only person... That whose face and aura that it would recognize to reopen the blast doors is he who remains. Y'all, excuse me. <coughs> I hope that wasn't loud on y'all. I swear I'm sorry, but these allergies of mine are killing me. So, and this is Casey fanboying because he he meets his idol or Boris, who's who wrote the uh, wrote the book, and he wants him to sign it. But they're in a conundrum. They are in a conundrum because they can't open those blast doors unless they have the, the aura of he who remains. They don't have that. So then we get back to Sylvie, who is, you know, in, in Broxton, Oklahoma in 1982, child. And so look at that sign. And this was in 1982 where they said 40 billion served. I think it's I don't even know if they put that on the sign anymore. Because the last time I remember actually pay attention to that sign, I think it said like 200 billion served. And uh, I don't even know if they put that on the sign anymore. But that's an old school uh, McDonald's sign. And I just got so tickled. So there they are. They have dropped themselves on the sacred timeline in 1982 in Broxton, Oklahoma. And uh, Brad is like, hey, y'all do what y'all want to do. She's here. And I just want to go back home. He's real antsy. Now, let me let me go back because this was a blast from the past and it might be telling my age. But baby. <laughs> Excuse, me. Excuse me. This is an old McDonald's child. When I tell you old, I mean, because this is the machine where they just uh, the, the cash register. And if you worked in like McDonald's or Carl's Jr. or Hardee's or stuff like that, you had to have that skill of counting change and how to give somebody the, the, the correct change back. Now you just press the buttons and it'll tell you. But back then, those machines, so if they gave you a 20 and, and it was uh, $18.72, you had to calculate how much change to give them and give them back that change. See, that's when you had to actually use your brains, child. Not that people in this time period don't use their brains, but I'm just saying for those types of what now people think are mundane skills, you had to know how to do all of that. Child, this is something else, something else. And the, the menu just just beautifully displayed. You saw what you wanted. Nowadays, you they've got so many pictures. You can't see the price. You can't see anything. They've got so much other stuff going on, like the calorie counts and the stuff like that. All you want to know is how much does a sandwich cost and how much the meal costs. Now, back in 82, I don't I don't remember them doing like meals. You had to buy the drink separate. You had to buy the fries separate and you had to buy the burger separate back in the day. These like uh, meal deals didn't come around to probably uh, maybe the mid 90s. But back in the day, well, they did have them. Let me stop. But they were specials. Like you had just like, so you would have like a filet of fish meal and it would be for a limited time period. Yeah. Oh, Lord, I'm dating myself. Let's move on. Let's move on. So Loki and Sylvia meet again and they don't seem too happy to see each other. Uh, she's very upset with him because he uh, he didn't support her decision to kill he who remains. 
So she's very upset with him with that. So they go on her, they go on their break and uh, they go outside and they talk about it, but they don't really talk about it. But meanwhile, watch Brad. Brad is doing everything he can. Everything he can to get out of that timeline until he cracks and he tells them that, listen, Docs is 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 blowing up branches of the timeline and anything that's off the sacred timeline path. She is blowing them up. And so this was Docs's plan. You remember last last episode, they had all of this equipment. What are they doing with all of this equipment? This doesn't make any sense. They have all of this equipment. So apparently Brad here decided that. I guess it was his job to find Sylvie. He found Sylvie, but he found her in a branch timeline. So he figured, hey, they fixing to bomb this timeline anyway. I'm going to go on the sacred timeline, go back in time, and I'm going to become a big movie star. Baby, he comes up and he tells them what the uh, plan is. They bring it back and they see that they're pruning the branches. Now, this is where we see Sylvie appears. And then this is where we see, and, and, and you remember I talked about at the beginning of this episode how, how a bureaucracy can, can continue and continue and continue, and no one really knows what's going on because everybody has just like a little piece of something. So in other words, you work in a, a, in a factory or an assembly line. Everybody has their piece of something. And they do their piece. All they, everybody does their piece. They're so concentrated and focused on their piece. They're not really looking at the big picture about what happens at the end of their piece. Is it going to be something that's going to cause destruction? They don't care anything about that because everybody's, you know, they have their job. They know what their job is going to do. No one questions uh, what the end results are. And now you're looking, and, and this shot just covers it for me. You're looking at a whole bunch of people who are realizing that what they do causes harm. Their little piece, you've got B-15 that's going, bringing in variants. And then you'd have the judges that are judging the variants and then they're pruned from the timeline. Everybody does something different. You see what I'm saying? And now when they have the realization that every little piece that they're doing is causing a problem for something else, this is the horror that you see on their faces. The absolute horror because now they realize that each one of those branches of timeline, there are billions of people on there that are being killed. And poor Mobius, I think I got it. Here's the thing. They they realize it. Remember, all of this was all of this was uh expansive, maybe like 40 or 50 or 60, 70 branches. And I, they end up killing off 30% of those branches on that timeline. And you see the horror in Sylvie's faces because she knows that horror. They, 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 they killed off her family and her family's timeline. And she has that horror on her face. You see B15, B, B15 she is just mortified. I mean, she looks, she's almost in a, in a race for tears. And look at Mo, poor Mobius. He just looks, uh, he looks like uh, he's sick to his stomach. He's sick to his humming. Meanwhile, Casey has a hit on Renslayer's Tim Pad. Uh, they analyze it. Loki looks up and he sees that uh, Sylvie is there. He asks Sylvie to stay. She says she's not. She says that the TVA is rotten to the core and it needs to be destroyed. And there's Mobius. There is Mobius. Mobius it is finally sinking in the horror that they have caused. And to also understand that he has been doing this for more than 400 years, that their minds get reset back to just going about doing their work and doing their business. And he is just absolutely horrified. And he's so horrified that he knows he has a life on the sacred timeline. He, they, he knows that he was pulled from the timeline and he's too scared to go back and try to figure out what his life was. And we end on Sylvie back at the McDonald's with her little young manager. And that's the end of the episode. I will tell you, I, I, I enjoyed the episode. It, like I said, it wasn't as chaotic 
as uh, the first episode, but it was it was revealing. It for me, it was more introspective. I started thinking about bureaucracies and going back in nostalgia, looking at things and stuff like that. So for me, that's what I got from it. Now, I do, I, I, do, I haven't watched the pundits and their season two because I don't like to watch anybody else's review of it. So after I review, because maybe they come up with some stuff that's different. One of the things that's interesting to me is Ouroboros. And I, I don't think he's telling the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Something about, I got my good eye on him. It's something about him that that uh, I don't think he's telling the full truth about stuff. I think he, I think it's almost like, you know, they showed this handbook. I think he has placed everything everybody needs to know in this handbook. And he's not saying what they need to do. He's not going to tell them what they need to do. I, something about him just doesn't rub me right. I, I just don't know anything about it. And I think that that book has a lot to do with what's rubbing me. I think that book can get people back to wherever this new version of Kang is. I think that book has that information. Um, it's too early to sell. Since 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 uh, Docs blasted off thirty percent of the branch timelines, I think that the loom will have a little uh, relief and be able to work with the remaining timelines a little bit better. So I think the TVA is not going to be destroyed. But I think it's going to be working at higher capacity. Loki and Sylvie, I can't get a read on it because I never could get a read on whether they had a sisterly, brotherly bond, whether they were just in love with each other, which makes them in love with themselves. I can't get, but there is a kinship, a deep-seated kinship. And uh, on Sylvie's part, she... She seems to not be able to get Loki to understand the life that she's led and why were her working at McDonald's seems like the best thing for her. Because you remember at the beginning of last seat, last, yeah, last episode, when she went to the counter, she was like, I don't want any rats. I don't want anything with a head in it. I don't want anything like that. So for her to be able to sit in a McDonald's, I mean, just something just as, as mundane as a McDonald's and order off a menu like everybody else and not... Uh, and and have this level of comfortable like, hey, I can eat at McDonald's. I'm working. I can go to bed at night. I can do all of these things that I couldn't do because I was running from my life since I was a child. She can't get him to understand that because, you know, Loki comes from being the 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 adopted son of the king of Asgard. You know, he's always had what he wanted. He's always had his way and he cannot even begin to fathom. What, what Sylvie is going through. He can't fathom that, but he does understand because he's lived in that life, he does understand leadership and, 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 and a level of bureaucracy that he does see that there's something going on and, and she can't see why he has a thought process of he you who remains. He understands it because he understands, you know, he was there when um, Thanos well, he, you know, he was working with Thanos at one time. So he understands what it is to have, uh, <clears throat> like, the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know kind of situation. I think that's the situation that Loki is coming from. So we will see. I think it's time for us to at least get to Renslayer, see where she's at, what her, what quest is she's on that Miss Minutes put, sent her on. I think it's time because everything as far as going on with the TVA, we know it's 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 uh, it, it's chaos. It's uh, uh, you know, they've got to reconstruct what's going on. You have a whole uh, workforce that realizes that the work that they're doing is causing the deaths of billions of people. Yeah. And they're having to reconcile with that. Uh, he who remains is dead. So there is no Kang. To be there to tell Miss Minutes or whoever he told or or Boris or whoever he's told to wipe their minds and let's start all over again. 
He doesn't have them there like that. So it's going to be interesting how the TVA functions from now going out. It's going to be interesting to see how they function. But like I said, we need to see Renslayer. We need to see what's going on there. I would like to go ahead and move us towards Victor Timely and go from there and see what Loki and them do. All right, people, that's all I got. Tell me what you all are thinking about this show. Uh, this is the second episode out of 10. Uh, this episode, I'll give it a, a seven and a half. I was interested. It kept my interest. I did like the, uh, I, I like, uh, again, you saw me. I like that old retro stuff. You know, I, I, I'm going to find that picture and I may do a little short of this, uh, this refrigerator that I saw years ago. But anyway. You know, we do this every week. Please like, comment, and subscribe down below. I appreciate your comments, and I appreciate... Oh, I can't look because, damn. But I am almost at 300 subscribers. <laughs> Help me get to 1,000. I would appreciate it. Tell a friend, tell a kin, tell your coworkers. Even tell that heifer you can't stand that I'm over here making my these videos. And as always, people... Buh-bye.